Hello there, and welcome back to the Chaps Guide. My name is Ash, and I am your host on this journey through men's style, self-development, and personal grooming. Now today, I would like to share with you the buying experience of my first luxury watch some three plus years ago. Because I know I, I often drop in watch content onto the channel, and I guess it's only worthy of me sharing with you where the journey began for me. Now, you know it's a Rolex Datejust because you've seen the thumbnail, but it's important for you to understand the background and where the Datejust came into my life. Because I was born in 1970, so my later childhood, early adulthood, was very much in the, uh, you know, the 1980s, 1990s. And I was influenced by the style of the era. And for those of you who weren't around back then, you probably would have difficulty uh, understanding that they were very ostentatious times. You know, the most popular television program was Miami Vice. And the lead character on that was Sonny Crockett. And he wore a two-tone Rolex Datejust for most of the series. Drove a Ferrari. And the people that you encountered in life, uh, you know, who were doing well in the 80s and 90s, they very much liked to display, to demonstrate the symbols of their wealth. And at the time, they were hot hatch cars in Europe, you know, souped up versions of family hatchbacks, things like that. And people wore brightly colored clothes like Miami Vice. It was very much a trendsetter. Uh, and the wristwatch, which people tended to wear to demonstrate their success, was the Rolex Datejust. Probably the most common watch you'd see around back then, the most popular of the Rolex brand, would have been the 36 millimeter Rolex Datejust in two-tone, in stainless steel and gold. Uh, the very watch that nobody wants to buy in the modern era. Now to understand perhaps why I picked this watch, you need to know a bit more about my journey through life. And as you know, I was born in 1970, 51 years ago as I record this, into a coal mining community in South Wales. And it was a community which was entrenched working class, without a doubt. And my background is very much working class. Uh, my dad earned his living back then in engineering. You know, we were a absolute working class family. We lived in a terraced house. And for me, the spectacle of things like Miami Vice and these luxury items which they had, you know, Ferraris and Rolex watches, was the thing of fantasies and dreams for me. It would have seemed like a world away and absolutely beyond the reach of my young life. Um, and yeah, I think most people brought up with my background and in, in that community would have felt the same. Now, I would have been certainly influenced towards Rolex because I would have seen it in television programs displayed as, you know, the ultimate symbol of success. I was also, from a young age, a big fan of Formula One. And, of course, Formula One has long since had a relationship with Rolex as their official timekeepers. And I would have seen, you know, the Rolex crown over the, uh, over the track when for me, my childhood star was um, Nigel Mansell. Uh, you know, as he flew past in his Williams racing car towards the World Championships and things like that. So I was very much influenced from an early age by Rolex's marketing, either intentional or otherwise, uh, you know, where they placed their products in the media of the era. As the years unfolded, I always maintained quite a strong interest in quality luxury wristwatches. From a very young age, I would have known what a Rolex was, an Omega, Breitling, all of the, you know, the quality pieces, uh, even though they were beyond my wildest imagination. But I took a, a sort of pleasure in profiling the people that I would meet in life, you know, by making an initial assessment of them, by looking at the quality of the clothing they were wearing, particularly the shoes they were wearing, but very much so the wristwatch on their arm. Because, you know, you look at a watch and it, it is a physical demonstration 
in many cases of the level of the success of the person wearing that watch because they have apportioned quite significant funds towards a significant purchase and you look at somebody perhaps wearing a Rolex you look at somebody wearing an Omega and you can draw an inference now you could say that is very shallow and perhaps it is but when you first meet somebody you can only take in the evidence that your eye can see when you get to know them when you understand more about them then you judge their character differently but visually you look at them you see the watch that they're wearing and this would have influenced me growing up you know as a younger person as a young man well before I could even remotely Im imagine owning a piece like that myself I respected these quality timepieces and I understood their value when it comes to you know the phys physical articulation of your style and your taste now I never had the money to invest in a, a quality timepiece and this was something of a frustration because through my life I've earned my living uh, in perhaps quite noble professions. For the first 10 years of my working life I served in the military so I was in the service of my country and then the last 25 years of my life before I retired last year um, I was in the service of my community. I worked in law enforcement. Now whilst these are as I say quite noble jobs or vocations it's true to say they're not particularly well remunerated so I certainly never had any loose cash slushing around that I could have ever uh, apportioned to say a Rolex or an Amiga wristwatch you know that sort of money for me would have been a new car rather than a watch so a little bit frustrating but there we are that frustration for me was such that in my 20s 30s and 40s I rarely wore a watch. I wore a watch in work when it was necessary, a functional utilitarian piece. I often wore uh, things like Loris field watches or uh, Casio digital watches, but they were not things of love for me. But when I went out into a group of people socially, perhaps, I chose not to wear a watch rather than wear something which to my mind would have been inferior. It would have felt like I was pitching below the level that I was interested in if I, if I was to wear something of low quality or something which was a homage or a replica. So for much of my adult life I actually didn't wear a watch at all. Eventually I came to a point in my late 40s where I decided it was time to make a purchase of a luxury watch. I'd been careful all my life, I had some savings and I actually thought to myself it's now or never you know I was approaching um, re mandatory retirement point in the profession I was working in and I thought well if I don't buy one now I am never going to have a decent watch you know I'm going to end my life having never known the satisfaction of owning a quality timepiece so I decided to take the plunge and it's at that point I had a serious decision to make so why did I decide to choose Rolex for my first and potentially only at that time luxury watch well it is fair to say that the idea of Rolex was firmly ensconced in my mind because of those earlier experiences I had around you know the, the Rolex marketing world uh, in sports and in things like Miami Vice but also I was heavily influenced by a character I often reference in my videos and that's James Bond. I was very much a fan of the literary Bond, the Ian Fleming version of Bond, in which there are references in the books to Bond wearing a Rolex and I'd grown up uh, of course seeing Sean Connery wearing the Rolex Submariner in the early Bond films so I was very much of a mind that Rolex was associated with the Bond character so definitely that solidified in my mind this was a watch brand that I could get behind because of its association with you know this commander James Bond character the only other brand which I seriously considered was Omega and again that was because of the fabulous marketing job they did uh, by shoehorning the Omega Seamaster pieces and all the other Omega pieces in the Bond films since the Pierce Brosnan era onto the, um, the Daniel Craig era uh, and very much you know part of that character today so that was the decision it was either Rolex or Omega well after a lot of careful consideration and thought it was Rolex for me you know after all that history outweighed the product placement by Omega in the Bond films and I thought Rolex is for me so why did I choose the date just well 
why don't you come in, have a look, and I'll talk you through my decision. So here it is. Here is my first luxury watch. The Rolex Datejust, 36 millimeter. So why did I pick the most classic of all the watches? Well, for me, the Datejust just shouted class. It had heritage, it had that history. It's been around since 1945. And for me, it just screamed classical. And that is what I was looking for at that point of my life. Uh, you know, it's just so immediately recognizable as a Rolex piece. That fluted bezel that you see glinting in the light right now. The Jubilee bracelet. Um, everything about this, the Cyclops magnifier over the date. For me, it was just utter Rolex. And when you're going to buy a luxury watch, which for you in your mind is the only one you're ever gonna have, you want something which screams luxury. And the date just, just really spoke to me. I also like the fact that with its screw down crown and its very robust bracelet uh, and its Oyster Perpetual case, of course, you know, giving it 100 meters water resistance, that it was a tough and rugged watch as well. It's not something which I had to baby to take care of and, you know, nurture. It was a watch I could throw on my wrist, wear every day, you know, jump in the pool with it when I went on holiday, wear it with a suit later that same day if I had to. And all of those things really spoke to me. Um, I went for the stainless steel, as you can see, because and, you know, I wasn't at all influenced by the current trend towards you know, stainless steel watches, which is now uh, taking it to the point where you can't even buy a stainless steel date chest, they're so popular. But back then it was just, it was just functional. It was you know, the toughest material um, and of course less expensive than the two-tone uh, models as well, which added a couple of thousand pounds onto the price. And that was important to me. You know, I, I didn't have money to throw around. Uh, the, the Jubilee bracelet, classic, beautiful. I particularly uh, was delighted to get the concealed clasp crown. I like the fact that the bracelet um, has that continuous look all the way around. So it gives it an almost jewellery appearance. And the colour of the dial, it had to be blue. I love blue. Uh, it's my favourite colour. My car is blue. The eyes of my beautiful wife are blue and it's the colour I choose to wear on most occasions, you know, even subliminally. I always pick blue where I can. So it was the ideal colour for me and the ideal size for me. 36 millimetres, perhaps considered modest in size in the modern era, but for a man with a six and a half inch wrist, it is a perfect fit, as you will see when I place it on my wrist in just a moment. Um, I've always particularly enjoyed the fact that the, the date wheel has alternating colors between black and red. So on odd days, you have a red number. As you see, it's 11 there, showing the 11th today. But I love the fact, they call it the roulette wheel because of the black and red, same as a roulette wheel. But I really love that little bit of contrast, that little bit of red with the blue of the dial just looks great. And the glint of the light on that fluted bezel just does something for it as well. Very simple um, dial in, 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 in any other regard. The Starburst um, dial itself, the blue, you know, it's not particularly sunny today. We're in overcast conditions, so it's not really bringing the blue to life, but it does really jump around when there's some good sunlight on it. Otherwise, the dial, pretty functional, pretty ordinary, pretty easy to read. Um, luminescence on the hands and the indices. That nice little Rolex crown applied in white gold at the 12 o'clock. Very, very nice. And yeah, it's been the watch which has been my favourite for many years now. And it will be for many years to come. So most importantly, I think you really need to know what it looks like on the wrist. I apologise for the reflection on the dial of the watch. But actually, you know, I think you get the idea. It is quite nicely proportioned for my six and a half inch wrist. It's sufficiently light that, you know, it never feels fatiguing, unlike some of the larger watches I own. Uh, and it's always a pleasure to wear, you know, something which can be thrown on with a suit, with a, with a tweed jacket like I'm wearing today, or equally at home, really, just with shorts and a t-shirt on an exceptionally warm day. 
So yeah, there's a lot to be said for the old classics. I think the Datejust is underrated in the Rolex collection today. It's seen as being that watch which is always in the jewellery store that nobody really wants, while everybody is, you know, ploughing into the, the professional range. But there's a lot to be said for this little gem, and it's a watch which I wear every day, and I have to say, I can't imagine an occasion will come where I will ever part with this piece. So it was a pretty easy decision for me in the end to buy the Rolex Datejust. And even my buying experience sticks in the mind because it was actually my father's 88th birthday. And I took my parents out with my little boy who was on, uh, home from sco on school holidays. We went to a local town and I was, uh, we were going out for afternoon tea. And we were walking down the high street past a Rolex authorised dealer. I glanced in the window and this fellow was staring out, looking me in the eye. Now, I wasn't in a position to buy it there and then. I thought, you know, I wasn't ready to make a purchase, but I had a, a sort of eye on the market. I walked into the store thinking, I'll just try it on to see what it looks like. Well, we've all been there. The rest is history. Quick phone call to the wife, and I came home with this on my wrist. I haven't looked back. I will always remember that particular day where I sat in that authorised dealer, my eight-year-old son on one side, my 88-year-old father on this side, me in the middle, and me looking at this watch, which seemed like a great thing for me to have achieved, to be able to buy and invest in a watch which I had desired for many, many years. And I was finally able to reduce it into my own possession. So that's the story, really. That's where my love of luxury wristwatches began and why I made the Rolex Daytrust the first watch in my small collection of luxury pieces. I hope you've enjoyed learning a bit more about my love of watches and in fact a little bit about my backstory there as well. If you have, I would encourage you to give us a thumbs up to let me know that you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget, if you're not a member of the Chaps Guide community, click the red button and join us as a subscriber. I would love to have you along for the journey as well. Now until the next time, Take care of yourselves and I hope to see you back here again very soon.